Supermassive black holes are an incredibly destructive force. They warp space-time around them, and they can swallow even light itself. They're the ultimate exit doors to our universe. And what I'd like to convince you of today is that they haven't really deserved this sinister reputation. That even though they can swallow light. Black holes, at least some of the time, can be the brightest objects in the whole universe, and that they play an incredibly important role in shaping our cosmos, the evolution of galaxies, and allowing maybe even for the development of life like our own itself. What is a black hole? A black hole is actually a very, very simple object. Any object can become a black hole. The only difference between, say, our Earth. Or our galaxy, and a black hole is the density. So if we collapse, say, our own Earth, our planet, down into a mathematical point, it becomes what we call a black hole. And in fact, the black hole really is this, this mathematical point at the center, which we call the singularity. And this point, Einstein's general th theory of relativity tells us, becomes a point with infinite density. Now, of course, quantum mechanics tells us that's impossible. And so the singularity is actually one of the places where our knowledge of modern physics breaks down. Now this isn't really a problem because the singularity is always hidden behind what we call the event horizon, and more of that later. So any object can become a black hole, can collapse into the singularity, and that means our black holes are very, very simple objects. They just have three simple properties: they can have a mass, so how much mass did it fall into that black hole? They can have a spin. That means that the black hole can spin to some degree, and at least in principle, it can have an electric charge.、Uh, and in general, in astrophysical applications, the kinds of things that I study,、uh, we ignore the charge. So it's really just the mass and the spin. So why does nothing able to escape from a black hole? Why do things, even light itself, get stuck near a black hole? Well, let's. Take the difference to a normal object like our Earth. So I put a baseball player, Babe Ruth, on the surface of the Earth, and he can hit a ball. And if he hits the ball really hard, the ball will go up, and then the pull of gravity from the Earth will pull it back down to the surface. Now, in principle, if Babe hits the ball really, really hard, that ball can escape the gravitational well of the Earth and go off into infinity.、It、can escape the Earth itself. If we now collapse the Earth into a black hole and put Babe Ruth right next to the singularity, we can repeat the experiment. But the difference is that no matter how hard he hits the ball, it will never escape. It will always fall into the singularity. The reason for that is that the escape velocity near the singularity exceeds that of the speed of light, and nothing can move faster than the speed of light. So there's no way you can get out of the vicinity of the black hole. And the event horizon is simply the point where the escape velocity is, is exactly the speed of light. So the event horizon isn't really a surface; it's just the ultimate point of no return. Once you cross it, no matter how fast you go, you can never get away again. And that's why it's a black hole. There are also other important differences to what happens near a black hole compared to a normal object. So again, imagine we collapse the Earth into a black hole. And an astronaut tries to orbit it. So this astronaut, she's trying to orbit、uh, this black hole. And unlike around the Earth, where a stable orbit is perfectly possible, around a black hole, once you get close enough, there is no more stable orbit. And so she'll inevitably fall into the black hole. And it's worse than that because the tidal forces, the gravitational field near the black hole, is so strong that the force of gravity on her head is not as strong as the force of gravity on her feet as she. Falls towards the black hole, and so as she falls into the black hole, she'll be stretched and torn apart further and further. And the technical name for this process is spaghettification. So, what kind of black hole would we actually get if we took the Earth and collapsed it into a black hole? So, the Earth is—you know—we know it. It's, it's kind of big, but if we turn it into a black hole, how big do you think it would get? Well, keep shrinking, keep shrinking. The animators worked on this for quite a while. And it keeps shrinking, keeps shrinking. Well, nine millimeters. So a a black hole with the mass of the Earth is just about nine millimeters across. 
If we take the sun instead and collapse the sun into a black hole, we get something that's about three kilometers across. And so our Milky Way galaxy is full of these stellar mass black holes that have maybe a few solar masses. These are the, the corpses of massive stars that died in supernovae. And if they're cannibalizing a companion star, they light up in X-rays and gamma rays, and we see them in the sky, and we can study them. But that's kind of still too small for me. So I study supermassive black holes that live at the centers of galaxies. So this is now a supermassive black hole, and it's got a mass of four million times that of our sun. And I chose that number specifically. It's an oddly specific number, and I'll get back to why I picked that number in a second. So this black hole now has a radius of 0.08 astronomical units. An astronomical unit is simply the distance from the Earth to the Sun. So now we have a kind of sizable object, but actually the universe makes even bigger monsters. So the largest black holes, the most massive black holes that we know, are about 10 billion solar masses. So these are the truly supermassive black holes. And I've indicated here the orbit of Pluto, so that means we could fit our entire solar system comfortably inside this supermassive black hole. So as I said, we think that most galaxies, maybe all galaxies, contain a supermassive black hole at the center. And in fact, we're not even sure what was there first, the black hole of the galaxy. It's one of these chicken and egg problems. And there's one galaxy that has a four million solar mass black hole, very specifically, and that's this galaxy, which I think you will recognize it's our own, it's the Milky Way. So at the center of the Milky Way lurks a supermassive black hole. In fact, if we zoom in, uh, what you see here is a, is a reconstruction or a model of the motions of a couple of dozen stars or so at the center of the Milky Way. And you can see they all orbit this empty spot in space. And so using actually just Newton's gravity, you don't even need relativity for this, you can work out how much mass do I need to put at this empty spot to fling around these stars like crazy. And it turns out that number is exactly four million solar masses. And so this is work that was done by astronomers in California and in Germany. And uh, you know, that is our supermassive black hole. And this is why we know it's there. Now, an important point here is that this is maybe a few dozen, maybe a few hundred stars that really feel the gravitational pull of the black hole. Now, our Milky Way has something like 100 billion stars, including our own sun. And so virtually none of the stars in the Milky Way really feel the gravitational pull of the central black hole. So it's an important point to remember. We're not about to fall in to the Milky Way black hole. Now, the Milky Way black hole currently is quiescent. It's sort of flaring on occasion, but it doesn't really do very much. But when supermassive black holes feed, they light up and they become quasars. We call them quasars. Here's an artist's concept of what this might look like. Uh, we can't really image this directly yet, uh, but what we believe happens is that the material starts spiraling into the black hole and it forms an accretion disk. And that accretion disk gets enormously hot and radiates light, and you might form relativistic jets that come out at the poles, and so a supermassive black hole, when it turns into a quasar, becomes enormously bright. So here's a real image of a galaxy merger, a galaxy collision, where we now have a central supermassive black hole, the black holes have merged, and you can see the star-like object at the center of this merging galaxy, and that's the quasar. And so in this galaxy merger, there's something like 100 billion stars put together, doing nuclear fusion, you know, the holy grail of energy policy. 100 billion stars doing nuclear fusion. And that supermassive black hole at the center, it's about a billion solar masses or so, is putting out more energy than 100 billion stars put together. And all that from a volume may be the size of our solar system. And the reason for that is that deep gravitational wells, black holes, are the most efficient engines in the universe. So you all know, Einstein's famous E equals mc squared, so mass is the same as energy, but c squared is a very, very large number, so a little mass gets you a lot of energy. This quasar, this black hole, is currently feeding on something like a solar mass per year and turning a good fraction of that straight back into energy. Now, a solar mass per year is a bit of an esoteric quantity. You probably don't use it in your daily life. And so one uh, evening over some drinks, we tried to come up with a, 
with a more uh, tangible number what a solar mass per year is, and it turns out to be almost exactly one moon per second. So this quasar is turning one moon, one Earth moon per second, into pure energy, and that's why black holes are the brightest things in the universe. So what does all this energy liberated by black holes do? Is it just you know pretty? Do we see it in the sky? Do we get to study it and admire it? Or does it have a deeper function? Does it have a deeper role in shaping our cosmos? And many astrophysicists, including me, believe the answer to that is yes. It's actually really important to shaping our universe, our Milky Way. But to explain to you why this is, I have to give you a brief introduction to galaxy formation, galaxy formation 101, if you will. So as you all know, the universe started with a big bang, and right after the big bang, all we had were tiny little quantum fluctuations, which were、um, vastly enlarged by this epoch we call inflation. And when that was over,、uh, the universe developed further, simply under the influence of gravity. And so what I'm showing you here is a simulation done by scientists at MIT and other institutions of you know all the physics, all the knowledge we have about galaxy formation. You can see. These structures start building. So these are these tiny quantum fluctuations that blew up and now collapse under gravity, and so they form halos of dark matter. They become larger and larger, and they collapse. And then the gas, the normal matter, streams into these halos. And when the gas gets to the center and it cools down and gets denser and denser, it starts to form stars. It makes stars, and of course, around stars we make planets like our own. This is where we like to live. The problem is in simulations like this. If you just let them proceed, you know, collapse under gravity, the galaxies get too big. There's too much star formation, and so what we need is a thermostat. And you start to see it acting here. We need a way to dial down the cooling and the star formation. And we believe the mechanism that does that are the supermassive black holes. So physicists love、um, slightly pretentious names for problems. So this. Runaway star formation, runaway galaxy formation—we call the overcooling problem or the overcooling catastrophe—and we believe that black holes solve this problem. You see these explosions; these are the supermassive black holes going off, putting all this energy back out, stopping the gas from cooling, throwing it back out of the galaxy, and so regulating the formation and evolution of galaxies, including galaxies like our own Milky Way. So I'm an observational astrophysicist. I, I use data. I observe the universe, and I try to find evidence for this process, for this regulatory role of supermassive black holes. And so what I'm showing you here is the deepest image of the X-ray sky ever taken. It's actually a tiny, tiny patch on the sky,、uh, but it was taken by the Chandra X-ray Observatory, which is a, a bus-size X-ray telescope in space. It was launched by the space shuttle. And it stared at this tiny patch of the sky for more than a month to record all these little points that you see, all these little light sources. So these are X-ray sources, and almost all these points that you see here are black holes feeding on material. So you see the the final death scream of the material as it falls into a black hole. And some of these black holes, active black holes, are in our neighborhood. They're near to us. And some of these are at the other end of the universe. And so, what you're seeing here really is a full record of the growth, the formation and growth of black holes, together with their host galaxies, from the beginnings of the universe until today. And I want to understand how this process works. So, the kind of research we do, the kind of new approaches that we take to this problem,、uh, include things like trying to understand the full life cycle. Of black holes, so galaxies are very large objects.、Uh, the Milky Way has a characteristic timescale. So if you poke the Milky Way, it will respond on a timescale of about 100 million years, which to me as an astrophysicist is, is actually kind of short. But if you think about it, that's longer than the time since the dinosaurs died out. So galaxies are kind of slow-moving things, but black holes aren't. Black holes may be acting on much shorter timescales, and so what I'm showing you here is. Um, work in progress that my students and postdocs and I at, at ETH are doing.、Uh, these are Hubble images of merging galaxies.、And、what you see in green here is gas that's been lit up by an active black hole, by a quasar. So imagine you have a, a fog bank at night, and you take a flashlight and you shine it on that fog bank, and now you see the fog. 
This is essentially the same idea, except the flashlight is a supermassive black hole, and the fog bank is a gas cloud the size of a galaxy. And because it's so large, it's tens or hundreds of thousands of light years across, that means the light from the quasar took an awfully long time to get to the cloud and, and light it up, which means we now have a record of the accretion history, of the shining, of the energy output of the black hole over time, over the last 10 to 100,000 years. And that's really exciting. And so this is starting to allow us to reconstruct the accretion history, the, the flickering, the variability of supermassive black holes on time scales beyond that of a PhD thesis. And so what we're hoping to see in the end is something like this behavior. So in this case, what I'm showing you is data from a star, and the star gets brighter and fainter, and it goes up and down and up and down. You can see the echoes of these activity pulses moving out across uh, the gas and dust surrounding the stars. And so we're trying to do something like that, but for entire galaxies, and where the source isn't just a star, but a quasar. So I hope I've convinced you that supermassive black holes aren't just you know, a dark force of destruction, but that they're actually really important, that they're the brightest things in the universe, and that they're essential to shaping our universe. What you're seeing here is what it would look like in full GR if we fell into the black hole uh, near the center of the Milky Way. And you can see these uh, distortions as the universe recedes from us. And I believe at this point, we've already passed the event horizon. So there's no way back. We're already inside. We're already doomed. And so now there's really nothing left to do uh, but wait until we hit the singularity, which will be any moment now. That's it. Thank you very much.